and I love talking about this, Tom, because, you know, the idea of maintaining a diary, right, to, to, to all these hyper type A badasses <laughs> running around is like, that's like soft, right? It comes yeah. across as like, man, I'm not doing that. That's, that's, that's weak. That, that's, <laughs> Dear that's diary. for girls. That's yeah. like, you know, whatever, right? Dear diary, like yeah. uh, having a bad moment, right? But there's something that I do, something I'm proud to say I do, right? Uh, I'm confident enough to, to, to throw that out there and be like, yeah, I do this just about every day. And I will maintain that because I've seen the value in doing it. So it's something that I certainly advise most people to do. Yeah. Especially guys in my industry, like get past the, the macho thing for a second and just try it, man. And if, if it, keep it to yourself, like you don't need to tell anybody, but I can guarantee for the most part, just about everybody will be able to take something, something positive away yeah. from doing that. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is tomrollandpodcast.com and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRolandPodcast.com. And the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram. Or you can go to our big account, Saltwater underscore Experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now, let's get on to today's show. Hey, I'm Nick Lavery, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. Nick, how are you, man? I'm doing well, brother. It's good to see you again. So good to see you. You got lots of good things yeah, going man. on. Um, yes, I've been... so do you. I love the t-shirt, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I'm uh, awesome very, stuff. very happy to uh, to be drinking the Black Rifle Coffee. It's a great yeah, company. Man, absolutely. Great company. I love what mm-hmm. they're doing with the veterans, and and uh, it's great coffee. It really is. It's fantastic it is. coffee. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's one thing to have a good product. It's another thing to have a good product with with an awesome vision and yeah. awesome people behind it. Yeah, right? That's exactly like the, what like they the got going combo. on. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, well, you're you're a good example of that. You got a new book out. First of all, how in the it's world about do you... to be out? Okay, so it's getting ready to come out. So I have two questions. First of all, how in the world do you find time to write a book? Secondly, uh, why do you want to write a book? Like what, what, yeah. what do you, what, what is it? What message is it that is so important to you that you want to put it in a book form? Great. great two awesome questions, man. Uh, I guess the, the first one is how do you find time? How did I find time? I really didn't uh, find <laughs> it. Um, I guess you could say I just kind of uh, engineered it and made time for it. Just, I prioritized it. Right. Um, and that kind of leads into the why a little bit. And I guess the, the shortest version of the story, man, is if you take it back to about sometime mid-2019, right, time frame. And I've been on the social platforms for quite a bit of time, more and more kind of gradually kind of exposing myself to the public and questions are coming in more and more frequently, which is great. And I was getting a lot of stuff from new amputees or wannabe SF guys, aspiring SF guys, uh, guys and gals that are going through some kind of issue or injury 
And it was a big, the, the same question I was getting repeatedly, which was, how did you do what you did? Mm-hmm. Right. So again, this is 2019. This is about four ish, five years past my first deployment as an amputee, which was in 2015. Um, so a lot of the same question, right? How did you do what you did? Because these people are dealing with their own set of circumstances and they're looking for some, some lessons learned, some motivation, whatever it is. So I'm answering the same question relatively hundreds and then thousands of times over the course of, you know, three, four years. So again, around 2019 timeframe, I decide to basically compile the answer to this question into a single document. And I just open up Microsoft Word and I do some thinking and some some reflecting and I'm going through my journal and my logs and I'm just kind of compiling this data. So I can create a very short, concise manual, if you will, solely for the purpose of efficiency. Mm -hmm. So when I get this question in, I can just copy, paste, attach, send, here you go. Good luck. This is what I did. That's truly the genesis of it, man. So again, this is 2019 timeframe, and I follow through on this, and I create something that's maybe 15, 17 page Word doc, right? Kind of just outlining. Interesting enough, I actually learned quite a bit about myself through that process, even though it really wasn't all that in depth. I wasn't on this soul searching mission. It was just so I could get people this answer quickly right. and efficiently. So I'm doing that. I'm copy paste, then attach, send, attach, send. Boom! Like my plan worked. It was great. Well, the the summer of 2020 comes around, right? And COVID is running rampant and people are locked down and fighting all this extra time on their hands, all this extra time and energy on their hands. And that was no different for us, right? Even in the military, we were teleworking or working remotely for quite a bit of time, which was a strange time for all of us. Yeah. And I, so I got all this extra time and energy. And one of my best friends, we went to college together, been friends over 20 years. His mother has been in the book industry for her whole entire life. He reaches out to me randomly in June of 2020 and says, hey, man, uh, when are you going to write a book? I think you should write a book. And we kind of have this conversation. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. And I don't know. What would I even talk about? And he's like, no, man, seriously. Like, have you thought about it? He's kind of, he's continually at it and he's prodding me and again this is my boy and uh i'm like you know what he his name's eric i'll give it some thought i'll get back to you he's like cool and i do that and now now the wheels are spinning and i'm going is this something that i would seriously do and we kind of have a second conversation he's like what do you think like you know what man i kind of already started one Mm -hmm. although it really wasn't a book you know, it's just kind of this short template, this short guide, but I've been using it and sharing it and getting great feedback. And uh, I do have all this time and energy on my hands. And he's like, yeah, man, just play around with it. Kind of just start writing a little bit. So I did. And uh, as crazy as it sounds, Tom, and I never would have thought this about myself just even more than two years ago, but I actually really enjoy writing, which is strange. <laughs> um, you know, there's certainly like a therapeutic aspect yep, of it for, for me. Sure. So as I have a tendency to do, I got, I got real dialed in. I prioritized it really high. Um, again, this is June, July of 2020. And my team and I have a pending deployment coming up in December. And I wanted to get it done by then because I was really in the zone. And it turns out I was doing about five, 600 words a day. Most of that around three or four o'clock in the morning, kind of before my day really started to kind of answer the first question a little bit. And, uh, you know, fast forward like three months and I'm at 67,000 words, close to 70,000 words. And, uh, you know, now you actually have a real book. So it still is very much what it intended to be back in 2019. It's still very much a guide. It's a manual, right? It's a personal development piece. It's not my autobiography. It's not my memoirs. It's not the Nick Lavery story. It's not a bunch of, you know, cool guy combat stories where we're buried up to our knees and hand grenade pins, right? It's not that. It's a it's a self-improvement piece, you know, focused on overcoming adversity and goal achievement. Um, so still that same model I had almost three years ago, I've just gone through in more detail, with more analysis, with more reflection and added kind of the, the personal touch 
You know, what, what was I going through at the time when I realized that this tenant, this principle has value just to give some context and some credibility to, uh, to what it's about, man. So yeah, that's, that, that, there's your story, brother. That's awesome, man. I can't wait to read it. Um, <clears throat> did you have somebody that like, like this friend of yours that did they like help you with an outline or did you kind of come up with an outline yourself? And at some point you just had to like, you know, feel like, okay, this is it. I'm taking off. And you're next thing you know, you're at 67,000 words, but did you have kind of a, a direction? I mean, you're just kind of expanding on this, this manual that you had written, or did you go deeper on certain things or like, how did you, how did you get to 67,000 words? Yeah. So I kind of, again, already had an outline to go off mm-hmm. of. Yeah. Um, which was kind of that just step-by-step breakdown. And the more I thought about it and I kind of just dove into each of these principles, the more I was extracting in terms of value. And then I kind of was just restructuring it as I went along. And then I was digging through my journals and my logs to try to find what was going on at that time. Right. Yeah. What was I feeling at that time? What was I doing at that time? What was working? What wasn't working? So again, a, a lot of a lot of reflection and in, in internal growth and an increase in self awareness of, of myself through this process, kind mm-hmm. of unintended consequences, which was really cool. Um, and it just kind of I just kind of kept going with it. So <laughs> I didn't have a, a a formalized plan other than I I, I want to keep it what it is. I want to be authentic. I want to refrain from the cool guy stories as much as possible. I want to give readers enough context as to what was going on at the time of this principle having value to me and or what have I been through since then that demonstrates the value of this principle or tenant. Yeah. And uh and yeah, you know, again, fast forward a few months and and boom, you're at like 240 some odd page manuscript that's awesome man you obviously got really excited about it what about the um you said you were going back and looking through journals and and logs and stuff like that how long have you been have you been writing like that and is that just like for the military like you're just keeping after action reviews and stuff like that or or did you journal awesome question i love you how you bring this up or why you bring this up the fact that you brought this up for me, it began with my training log. Mm-hmm. So for me, it began as spending time in the weight room and logging my sets, my reps, my intensity, my nutrition, and you know, fitness and nutrition and health and, and physical training has been a huge part of my life for a really long time, going back to when most of when I was in college playing football and my education within training and nutrition kind of really began. I, I fell in love with it. So I have training logs that go goes back to the early 2000s. And What I noticed over time was that while the sets and reps and the objective data has value, I I gradually began adding kind of these intangibles, right? How was I feeling at this time? Was my sleep? Kind of these other variables solely in an attempt to increase my my physical training capacity. But I began to look back, which is a huge value of having a training log. Hey, what have I been doing the last six months? Here's where I'm at. This is what I've been doing. I found myself paying much more closer attention to how I was feeling, what was going on, what were my stress levels like, more so than, hey, on this day, six months ago, you know, I squatted X weight for X reps, right? Like there was value there, but I was gaining more from kind of the conceptual, intangible stuff. So I just began adding more and more and more to it. And then eventually it just turned into its own product where I had my training blog and then I had an actual, you know, journal, right. Which I began seeing the value and and other people, mentors of mine that constantly preach about the value of journaling. And then, uh, you know, I just prioritized it. So I'd stop my morning off X, Y, and Z, and then spending five, seven minutes to just throw some stuff in there became part of my routine, part of my habit. And, uh, and I love talking about this, Tom, because, you know, the idea of maintaining a diary, right, to, to, to all these hyper type A badasses <laughs> running around is like, that's like soft, right? It comes yeah. across as like, man, I'm not doing that. That's, that's weak. That, that's, <laughs> dear that's diary. for girls. That's yeah. like, you know, whatever, right? Dear diary, like yeah. uh, having a bad moment, right? But 
there's something that I do, something I'm proud to say I do, right? Uh, I'm confident enough to, to, to throw that out there and be like, yeah, I do this just about every day. And I will maintain that because I've seen the value in doing it. So it's something that I certainly advise most people to do, yeah. especially guys in my industry, like get past the, the macho thing for a second and just try it, man. And if, if it keep it to yourself, like you don't need to tell anybody, but I can guarantee for the most part, just about everybody will be able to take something, something positive away yeah. from doing that. My son is way into journaling. He, he, he spends probably an hour or more a day. And he's been doing it now for about a year and a half. And he just, it's very therapeutic for him. He just really is, is totally into it. I'm interested though, when you're looking back on, on those journals and you, and you start to associate like, well, this was a really good period in my life. Um, you know, I was making progress in the gym. I was making progress at work. I was making progress in my, in my um, personal life, whatever it may be. And then maybe over here, this was, this was a really hard period of my life. Like for whatever reason, things weren't going exactly the way I wanted them to. I was lethargic in the gym. I, you know, it's the opposite, right? Which do you look to? Do you look to replicate the things that are w when it's good or do you kind of gravitate towards, man, I wonder what was going on here. Like, why was I not, why was this not a good period for me? Right. Do you, yeah. Do you think about that or do you have make any correlations with that? Yeah, I think I think I have a tendency overwhelmingly to focus on I don't want to say the negative, but focus on where where things weren't weren't good. Hmm. And I think the the I think that is really a product you brought up AAR already. I think that's a product of my of my military uh life to this point. Right. You know, we do AARs after after reviews after every single training event and good AARs focus on the improves, right? We tend to move quickly past the things we did well, but let me, let's annotate one or two quickly. Let's get to the things that we messed up. Like let's get to the mistakes that we made uh, and, and really talk through that stuff. I think that that's why when I look through uh, my log and my journal, I'm looking at where are my deficiencies and analyzing that more so than what am I doing well? Both have value, but if I had to say one or the other that I focus more on, I'd say it's probably on the areas in which I've identified a gap and a need for, for improvement. Mm -hmm. Now, these, uh, these principles that you're coming up with, um, have you developed them over, mm -hmm. over time or have they been kind of constant tenets through your, through your life uh, that, you're, that you're putting into this book? I'd say, I mean, a good portion of them go back to me as a child and the way I was raised, right? Nature and nurture combination. Um, most of which I would say is a product, again, of me being in the military. And uh, hey, there what's he up, is. buddy? <laughs> right, right on cue, my four year old. What's going on, man? You got stuff? Okay, cool. Hey, I'm on the phone. Can you give me a couple minutes? I'll be right there. Thanks, bud. Sorry about that, brother. <laughs> That's a, believe me, this audience has plenty, plenty of those, and everybody's like, "Oh, nice! I like this guy even more now." <laughs> he has a four-year-old. Yeah, man. Hey, four-year-old. That's, that's that's perfect. Four-year-old and a nine-month-old. So nice. To say things are, are hectic and busy. Is, before it's, uh, before be you know it, man, you'll have a twenty-four-year-old and a twenty-year-old and an eighteen-year-old like me, and it happens so fast. And dude, you just enjoy every every second of it. So that's never uh, that's never an issue here. We 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 like the the kids. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. Highlight of my life. I think uh, to wrap it up, what we're talking about, man, is most of these, you know, tenants principles um, are a product of my service in the military. And, you know, a lot of it was added on to a foundation that was there, but a lot of it really either didn't exist or I didn't even notice it until I came in and started living a life of more structure and more discipline and a higher degree of work ethic. And working within a team environment under extremely high circumstances, um, high risk environments. So I, I give I give most of the credit to what's inside the book to my military service and the guys that I've been able to work alongside them and learn from. And then kind of again, 
kind of retrospectively analyze, you know, how did I get to where I am now? Mm -hmm. Right. Like what, like, what did I focus on, um, through this portion or this, or this, or this challenge? And it took a lot of, you know, kind of in-depth soul searching and being honest with myself and increasing my degree of self-awareness. And, uh, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, kind of put the pride and the ego aside and just allow myself to get vulnerable with myself and say, you know, this really wasn't all about me being this, you know, alpha, full throttle, hundred mile an hour, you know, savage warrior. It had a lot to do with, you know, kind of the more, more of a softer side of my, of my growth process. And then just be willing to kind of put that out there, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that uh, challenging? For you? <laughs> yeah, man, it, it, it is. I mean, honestly, what what you and I are doing right now is challenges for me. Yeah. You know, um, I I grew up, although not in using the same terminology, but I grew up within this quiet professional environment, uh, mostly instilled in me through my father, right? Some of the, the cliche expressions I remember him telling me is, you know, walk softly, but carry a big stick mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, don't talk about it, be about it, right? He was very much and much is about the action behind what you do and you stay quiet and let your let your results speak for themselves. And then I ironically or not end up coming into Army Special Forces where, you know, one of our mottos is the, you know, the quiet professionals or mm-hmm. pseudonyms is one of the, is the quiet professionals, you know, and, and kind of struggling with that going all the way back to 2015, coming back off my first deployment as an APT, a lot of visibility, a lot of questions, a lot of publicity, if you will, mostly through the army and use of stock, but having to get comfortable with putting myself out there and realizing that, you know, it's not, this isn't about me and my desire to, to be in the limelight. It's, it's about the lessons learned and the experiences and being able to enable someone up coming behind me that may be struggling with something similar um, but still, man, it, it's still a challenge. You know, I do recognize now the difference between being a quiet professional and a sound professional. Yeah. And I know what my motives are. And I, you know, I know what my integrity lies, but still, I think it's going to always be a, uh, a challenge and just kind of a never ending transition process, which, you know, I don't think will ever actually end. Yeah. Sooner or later, you gotta, you gotta kind of come to terms with, with where you are and the message that you're delivering and, and realize that it's it's helping a lot of people. And, and for that reason, it's, it's worth doing, you know, and there is that line, like that real thin line of what is a quiet professional and, and when do you cross that line? Because I'm sure that you have tremendous respect for the people that you work with in the, in the whole Green Beret um, community. You don't want to go against that, but at the same time, you got real, real messages that you can help, help tremendous amount of people with like with writing this book and doing podcasts and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, man. And I'll tell you, Tom, it's real. It makes it a lot easier for me. And it's also really tough to put, we'll say a price tag on the kind of feedback that I've gotten over the, over the past few years. Some of it is some real, real heavy, you know, real shit, you know, where, you know, I've had spouses email me and say almost verbatim, my husband was about to blow his head off and he saw you heard, heard you saw dug in a little bit and now he's great. Or now he's doing better. You know, like when you get something like that, uh, it, it not only makes it slightly easier to continue to put yourself out there and in a lot of ways, risk kind of who I am and what I do believe in and the acceptance of the quiet professional mentality. Yeah that kind of feedback and being able to have that kind of an effect and, and positive influence on someone and their family is, uh, it carries a lot of weight, man. Yeah. And, and probably you feel a certain responsibility towards those, your brothers, right. To, to deliver this message. Right. So, so this book, what, uh, like what, what kind of things is it going to teach somebody that reads it? And do you need to be, do you need to be, you know, a military person, or is it, is it kind of designed to where anybody's going to be able to pick up these lessons that you're, that you've learned through the, you know, forged in fire, so to speak. Um, is that going to help the regular, a regular person just to, um, 
to set goals, accomplish goals, mindset? Like, what is it that is that this book is is going to do for people? You hope that it's going to. Yeah, do? man, it, it casts a pretty wide net. I'd almost say that the target audience uh, is is actually outside of the military. Okay, and certainly it will apply to military personnel. Um, but that's not who I had in mind while I was putting it together. And in fact, I had to be real deliberate about translating the vernacular and verbiage that we use in the military to make it understandable mm-hmm. to you, to a civilian. Right? I wanted to that. keep it authentic. Yeah, I want to keep it authentic to include the language that we use. Um, but I also want that to be able to be understood by a non-military personnel. Right. So there's a lot of footnotes in there where as you're reading along and I use kind of cliche expressions or jogging, um, again, to keep it authentic to, to the way we talk and how we operate. And then at the bottom of the page, it's like, Hey, this is, this is kind of what this means, which I think is kind of interesting and maybe just assist in kind of bridging the gap, um, understanding from a civilian life to military personnel. We're just talking about a handful of words. Right. Um, so I think that it's it's really designed for for anyone that is seeking a goal and or is having difficult time identifying the goal, hmm. particularly something that may seem insurmountable um, or unlikely. And, you know, just to kind of go into it briefly, it's really just it's broken down into two sections. First section is mindset. And the second section is strategy. Hmm. Right. And, you know, I follow and read a lot of, you know, self-help coaches, mentors that focus a lot on mentality and mindset. And I'm all about that. And it's, it's wildly underrated uh, for most of us and incredibly powerful. But my issue with that is, is it, it exists up in the clouds, right? You can't reach out and touch it. It's, it's mm-hmm. completely intangible. It's conceptual, Right. Because it's all in your mind, which, again, super important, critical, super powerful. But I didn't want to just stop there. I didn't want to just talk about what you're focused on and what you're feeling and how you can leverage that. I wanted to actually give uh, almost a blueprint and a breakdown that includes something that's real. Right. How do I create an actual plan and what are some of the actual tools that I can use to make that 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 plan practical, right? Day to day physical activities that you can do um, that enables that process. Mm. So I wanted to take it, take it, you know, begin up in the mentality world and the conceptual realm, but then I wanted to drive it all the way down to the tactical level, where you're talking about day to day practices, physical and otherwise, that people are able to implement, you know, immediately as soon as they read it. It's like, oh, I'm going to try this tomorrow. Like that's how granular I really wanted to get with it. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Because I, I, mean, I always love to talk to, to people like yourself and, and you especially, because you are really like on the extreme edge of, of what is possible in my opinion. Like you, you've just done some really amazing things and then you've encountered some really big setbacks and then you've done really amazing things after that. And to do that, you have to have exactly what you're talking about. You have to have the mindset that yes, it's possible, even if no one has ever done it before, like you completing dive school, um, that it is possible. And then, okay, if it is, if I do believe that it's possible, it's one thing just to believe it. It's another thing to actually go and do it. And that seems like that's what you're, what you're talking about is it's, you can just throw yourself into it. And that's one thing, but to create a real plan to prepare to, maintain that motivation throughout the whole process during the setbacks and during the disappointments and during, you know, no goal that seems insurmountable is going to be easy. And it's never going to come with, with, without disappointments and without hardships and without challenges and without setbacks. And that's what I'm looking forward to reading so much out of, out of this book, because you've, you've proven that throughout your life, that, that, that's what you, are, are capable of doing and have done. And you have this whole track record of doing it. It's going to be, it, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Like the book is not out yet, but it's coming out soon. Right. Yeah, man. Buying anything crazy uh, next week, it should be released, which is, uh, which is, which is crazy to think. <laughs> and I, uh, 
I've been asked this a few times since I've been kind of throwing it out there a little bit is, you know, how did you, how did you write it? And we talked a little bit about having a, having some kind of a plan, a way to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually also employed a self-publishing consultant. So I'm, I'm publishing it myself, not going through traditional publisher, but working, working through the wickets and the process of taking a 70,000 word, word document and then turning it into an actual book. There's a, there's a lot of steps there. And I began learning that process and eventually decided to, to onboard some assistance. Um, and it, it's, it's all on the upfront, you know, you pay and they don't own any of the book. They don't own any of the rights, no royalties, nothing amazing service. My point is, is when you look, when you're looking at a 70,000 word manuscript on Microsoft word, you know, for like a year. And then I hand it over to this team, uh, a member of that team handles interior design and she does her thing and, and makes it and then sends it back to me. And it actually looks like <laughs> a real book. It's like, holy shit. Are we like, am I really doing this? Cause at that point it's got, it kind of starts to feel real. Yeah. And then, you know, you get your proof copy in the mail. And I got one right here. This just showed up a few days ago and now you're physically holding it. And uh, it's just, you know, it's kind of a wild ride, man. Again, not, not a place where I've ever imagined me being going back just a few years. Um, but again, the, the, the intent is to, is to enable those that are struggling, enable those that have lofty goals, high ambitions, right? Uh, challenging dreams, and um, just to be a small part of, of that journey to, to enable them the best I can. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was interesting to me that you just said just a second ago is that is that some people don't even know what they are. Like uh, that's what I encounter a lot of times when people ask me. Maybe you know it might be about um, being a professional fishing guy. People, a lot of people ask me the same kind of thing. Like, how did you do what you're doing, and how do I follow my passion? I'm like, well, what's your passion? And that's where it stops right there. It's like, well, I don't know. And I, I, I honestly struggle sometimes to, to give them any advice past that. Like, well, you need to figure that out. Well, how do I do that? <sighs> Man, I don't know. I mean, did you have, is that part of like what, what is in this book is like a way for you to do this self introspection to, to kind of understand what it is that, that you really want to do. Because to me, that's like, man, I mean, that's a big part of success is knowing what you want. And a lot of people yeah. don't have any idea what they want. And then they go down some path towards what they think they want, but then they get about halfway there and they go, you know what? That I don't really, I don't even think I ever even wanted that. I wanted something yeah. associated with that, but I didn't want that now that I'm in yeah. it. And you spent two years trying to get to, to this thing. And it's like, huh. And so you see these people that kind of drift and waver and, and they have great intentions and they have great motivations and they have great work ethic. But the one thing that that's missing a lot of times is that they don't really have any idea what they truly want. And so what are your thoughts on that? Like, how does somebody, how does somebody find what they truly want? Yeah, I mean, I love it. Awesome stuff. And that is actually once you get to section two of of the book, uh, the first step of that process is identifying the goal. Mm. And we kind of talk through yeah. the importance of that. And then also some some advice from my perspective on how to go about doing that. Because nice. you said it, you said it, you already said it. Some people are driving at 100 miles an hour and they got all these intangibles, the motivation, the the inspiration, the work ethic. They're surrounded by great people but they're driving in the wrong direction, right? Or in a direction that they don't really don't want to be going in and they don't realize until they get there. The example I use in the book is, uh, is during the stock course during selection, which is the land navigation course you have to, yeah. you have to complete. And, uh, and uh, the quick story is no matter how many times the cadre told us, hey, to point, triple check your point, your time has started now. I was so determined not only to finish in time, but be the first person done that I plotted my points and I took off and I was flying through the woods, North Carolina in the middle of the night, point one, point two, I get to point three and it's, there's nothing there. And I spent hours looking for it until I go recheck my point and realize that I was off. I, I misplotted my point. So even though I got to where I intended to go, 
quickly and aggressively and successfully, I was in the wrong place, right? So the, the criticality behind identifying that goal from the very beginning cannot possibly be understated, right? right? You know, if you don't know where you're going, any road's going to take you there, right? So the, the, the two courses of action, and it's in the book that I recommend, is the first being just simply to, to spend some time with yourself, right? Call it meditate, call it deep thinking, call it what you want, you know, spend some time in a, in a dock room laying on the floor, go for a walk in the park, go sit on a bench, go to a beach, wherever you find yourself to be kind of in the most relaxed state where you can really think for real, and um, and just and ask yourself the two questions, right? What do I want to do and or who do I want to become? And be very honest with what that may be, right? And forget about what you have been projecting, what your, you know, your Instagram feed looks like, what you've been telling your friends and your family, like forget all that. This is just you and yourself and ask yourself those two questions and then shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I think that a lot of times what our purpose and or passion is doesn't always come screaming and punching us square in the face. It mm-hmm. kind of sneaks up behind us and kind of whispers. And you can hear it if you're listening. And if you're asking yourself the right questions and you're really listening to what your soul is telling you, oftentimes that answer will come. Mm-hmm. I like that as course action one, because I don't like limitations. And I'll kind of expound upon that in a second. Unfortunately, I should just say, eventually we got to get going, right? Like yeah. eventually we need to start moving in a direction. And, you know, I, I've, I've advised this and week after week, month after month, someone will come back and say, hey, man, I'm doing what you're saying. I'm laying in the cold dark room. I'm not hearing anything. Like, I, I still don't know. It's like, okay, let's move to course action number two, which I've heard as being advised from coaches and mentors as being the number one method. I'll explain why I have it as number two. And that really is to focus on your talents. Focus on your talents. Talent being what do you do best with the least amount of effort, right? Kind of our natural skill, if you will. Focus on those and then spend time formulating a strategy and a plan on how you can turn that into a profession or a lifestyle, right? That gives you a direction to go in. And a lot of people advise that out of the gate because it does increase your likelihood of success. And it's kind of common sense. If you already do this thing very well with the least amount of effort, Mm -hmm. and then you layer on miles and miles of hard work, and you increase a skill associated with a talent, which are two different things, then your likelihood of success obviously would go up. Right. Right. So then the question is, well, why not just do that initially if it's the most likelihood of success? And my answer to that is because I'm stubborn <laughs> and, I, and I don't, I don't really, I don't really buy into um, being dictated the direction I go in, even if I'm the one dictating it to myself based off of my talents. I like to keep the option open where if you're laying in that dock room and it hits you that you want to be a professional angler, right? Um, or a fishing guy or whatever, and you have never fished a day in your life, or you have, and you're horrible at it, right? It is not one of your talents, but something is telling you, man, I think this is why I'm put on this earth, and I love it, even though I suck at it. Who's to say you can't turn that into your lifestyle or your profession? Nobody, including you, right? right? So I just like to keep that option, that first course of action open, um, because you can always then go and look at your talents, which, which may take some time. Some people struggle and they're like, I'm not good at anything. It's like, yeah. no, no, no. You're, you're going to be good at something with the least amount of effort because it's all subjective, right? No matter what that may be, that gives at least kind of a direction to go in in terms of focusing your mental bandwidth on something. And then from there, you kind of develop that strategy based off of that. Man, love it. That's awesome, man. Yeah, there's uh there's so many people that um I don't know, maybe they were maybe they're a great athlete or whatever. You see, like it even plays out in like Hollywood. And I think there was a movie. What was it? It was like American Pie or some movie like that. And you know, you got the athlete, but what he and he's he's that's his that's his path of least resistance. He's a great athlete. And everybody expects him to be a great athlete and they're expecting him to go and do this. But what he really wants to do is he wants to be in the play. 
right? Like he wants to be in this play and he has to make this decision from football to, to the play. I don't know you see it in a whole bunch of, di- I mean, there's like a whole bunch of different things or maybe, maybe it's a different, two different things, but like there is that path of least resistance and there is those skills. There are those skills that you've developed over, over a course of time, but maybe you never even, maybe that wasn't ever really your passion. Like what you're saying is that you're just laying there thinking, I want to be, I want to do this. Like it may make no sense to anyone than around you, but that's where the passion is. And then if you can take all of that work ethic that you built being this athlete or being this, whatever this was over here and let, and just like you say, man, layer it on that place where there's passion. That's where, that's where big things happen. Right. That's, yeah, man. that's awesome. And I'd even take it a step farther, you know, passion and purpose, yes. right. Yeah. Two separate things most of the time very closely interwoven and most most of the time maybe the same exact thing but it could also be very different things mm-hmm. right passion being something that i'm in love with right like i love doing this purpose being kind of the answer to the question as to why am i here yes. like what is my soul like pulling me towards two different things again oftentimes the same but in that example you just laid on it's an awesome analogy because as a, let's say a football player, right? I loved playing football. Is it, is it possible, however, that I really love everything else that comes around yeah. playing football? Yes. Do I like the popularity? Do I like, you know, sitting at the cool kid table? Do I like being invited to the parties? Do I like people cheering for me when I'm playing, you know, on, on Friday nights, do I really love the game or do I love kind of some of the intangibles yes. that come along with it? where my purpose actually is I want to be on Broadway. I want to be on a stage and I want to be performing, you know, Shakespeare. Right. So again, having that, having that conversation, having that honesty with ourselves and having that increased degree of self-awareness, I think can help kind of identify these very specific pieces of our current lifestyle and then desired direction. Um, And then, you know, again, you break it down and then again, just come up, with the, you know, with the strategy and begin executing, which I'm kind of blowing over and eating a lot, a lot more difficult to actually do, but at least it gets people moving in a higher likelihood degree of success direction. Right. 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 Man, I can't wait to read it. I wanted to, um, to just kind of finish up here by asking you a few questions and, and uh, maybe some are on the, on the, same topic and some are, some are completely different, but um, I got about six questions. We can just kind of zip through them. Um, sure. All right. So in your world, it could be this world of, of uh, that you just wrote the book on, you know, finding, finding your purpose, finding your passion, finding, um, you know, something that you really want to do and accomplishing a goal, or it could be in a military setting. It could be football, could be whatever. What is, one or two things that you see others doing incorrectly that is totally clear to you that they could do better. What do I see others doing incorrectly that yeah. they could be it's doing? It's super better? obvious to you. And it could be in any any of the things that we've talked about, but just just something where it just stands out constantly. The first thing that comes to mind is is in the weight room, which I, I can relate just about anything to the fitness analogy because it fits <laughs> great in terms of life, right? Yeah. Um, in, in the weight room and seeing people working at 110% and not getting nearly that uh, as a return as a result of no strategy or a poor strategy or improper tactics, right? Um, and I do, I do, uh, I talk about this in the book and there's, there's an example and I'll just share it here now where I was, uh, I was at Fort Bragg and I spent a lot of time training in kind of the main, the main post gyms just to get off of our compound. And I'm in there and there's, there's this one kid and I see him, he's just going balls to the wall. I mean, he's out of his mind, work ethic through the roof, motivation through the roof, young kid, not in great shape, uh, kind of your typical young skinny kid. And at some point he comes over and he says, Hey man, I know are you, you, yes. Cool. Can we take a picture together? Of course. Boom. See you later. Have a nice day. And I see him there um, several times over the course of the next few months. I then deploy by six months and I come back and I see the same kid again in the same gym. And Tom, when I say this kid has made zero 
physical training progress. I mean, zero. I think he was actually wearing the exact same, the exact same outfit the first time I saw him. Nothing. And I'm like, what the, and he's still going out of his mind. And I'm like, "Ah, do I want to go over to this kid here in the gym and say, Hey man, like, what are you doing? You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hold off. I leave the gym and he happens to be parked right next to me in the parking lot. And he says, Hey man, hey, you know, good to see you again. I said, let's have a quick conversation. And I get into his car and I'm like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, you've got all this intensity and you've got this high degree of motivation and you're sweating and working and grunting and you're getting after it. You're making no progress. Like, what is your strategy? What is your plan? What does your programming look like? And you really didn't have one. And I said, okay, I gave him my email. We went back and forth real quick. I gave him some guidance and then, uh, and then I left. I deployed again, came back, saw him at this point, it was maybe a year or so later and you could barely recognize this dude. He had put on 35 pounds of muscle, right? He's wearing all this cool, trendy gym clothes and stuff like that. And uh, I see him and I, I'm like, holy shit, this dude looks phenomenal. And he comes running over and he's like, hey man, like I, I feel great, blah, blah, blah. The progress had been made, which was awesome, right? A huge win for him, for me, everybody's high-fiving, good stuff. Um, and you know, I just use that story as an example because what's frustrating is it's really difficult to teach work ethic and, and motivation mm-hmm. and a high degree of output. It, it, you can learn it for sure. I believe in that, but it's, it's something that's really difficult to teach. I could teach anybody how to do a back squat mm-hmm. um, or operate an M4, but to, te- to, to teach somebody or ingrain that level of production is significantly more challenging. And he had that. And I see that quite often there's just no structure attached to it. There's no plan. Like the research hadn't been done. There's no logging. There's no assessment phase. It's just going there a thousand miles an hour, smashing your face into a brick wall when there's a door right next to it, or you could just walk around it, or there's a ladder right there. Like, you know, let's, 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 let's work smart while we're working hard. And when you combine those two things together is when you really start to see some, some significant progress and, and some, uh, and some growth. So I think that just prior to beginning on any kind of mission or towards a goal, you're going to want to invest a little bit of time in research and, and putting together that strategy to get you moving generally in the right direction, knowing that the, the education isn't going to stop, but let's just get a game plan together based on the successes of other people that are do, either have done the same thing or have done something similar and just to mitigate that from happening. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. I like it. That's awesome. Uh, And good job for that, that kid to, to be making huge progress and for you to help him like that. That's awesome. Um, That is true though. Like it's, you see somebody that wants something, but they have no work ethic. That's going to be a tough one. You can give them all the plans you want, but somebody like that person that you, you mentioned, He's an easy person to help because he wants it. He wants the help. He just has no idea which direction to go in. You point him in the right direction, boom, 30 pounds of muscle right there. That's awesome. Oh, All right, so off. here's the next one. What are a couple of things that you do on a daily basis that you felt you feel uh, contribute to your success? Uh, first one that's going to make people cringe is uh, <laughs> I wake up really early in the morning. Um, I think that makes people cringe because – uh, many are tired of hearing that from people, the importance of getting up early. And then I think people also cringe because they've had to do it at some point and they hate it uh, because it sucks for, for most of us. Mm. Right. Um, but I do think that that is for me has been a critical piece, a uh, critical component within the equation. Um, mostly because, you know, we all have responsibilities and priorities, man, especially you got most of us in you know, a career and a family, right? Like those two things are highly, highly important. They take a lot of time and energy. And by, by getting up and beginning the day really prior to those things starting allows me or us the chance to be a hundred percent selfish with what we're doing, right? Like guilt-free selfishness. So I'm going to wake up an hour before my family does, or an hour before I need to be at the office and I can do whatever I want. It's not detracting from my responsibilities elsewhere. 
I'm just going to take this time for me and invest it however I want. Right. Um, so that's, that's certainly key. Um, I'll throw physical training in there because I can't not say that the, the linkage between our bodies and our minds and our overall successes, the, 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 the physical training realm is the perfect analogy for life. And we can break that down a hundred different ways, but train your body, prioritize, train your body. It doesn't need to be an hour and a half a day. It could be three days a week, 20 minutes at a time. You don't need a gym membership. You don't need equipment. Just, just exercise, right? Exercise your body. Like human beings are creatures of motion and that tends to have a, a second and third order effect to keep moving forward. And then lastly, we kind of already talked about it, Tom, is, uh, is logging and, and journaling, right? The therapeutic side is great, but it also assists us when we want to assess how we're doing, right? Like a, a, a objective analysis or as objective as it can be, as long as we're being honest at the time of the input, uh, but that feedback, like you have it right there in front of you. Again, it's a low calorie investment. You don't need to spend two hours a day going through this crazy long handed, you know, expose. It could just be four, five, six minutes, allocate the time, which then ties into kind of discipline and structure, right? So allocate the time, execute on that, put some stuff down, and then you have some data to go off of when things are either going good or things aren't going great. Love it, man. We were on exactly the same page there. I'm a early morning physical training guy. That's and it has to be that way, especially when my kids were yours, your kids' age right now. I mean, you try to do it in the afternoon, there is always going to be something. Always. And yeah, man. you do it in the morning and everybody's happy. That's your time. You're not it, it, yep. it's and it and it's uh it it's an it's a life enhancement. Right. Like that's what I talk to people about, too, about getting up early in the morning, too, is that that's a life enhancer because you're not taking away time from your family. You're not taking away time from your business. You are you are adding time to the day by getting up super early. So everything that occurs at that time is enhancing your life. You're not trying to exercise at dinner, bath and bedtime where you're taking away this super important time from your family. And sooner or later, you're going to get pushback. Your wife's going to be like, oh, you know, I'm glad you're losing a little weight, but man. Not at this time of the day, you know, so that's, yeah. not, that's not a consistent kind of thing. All right. What about, um, do you have a, a book or a couple of books that, that you've read that had a real impact on your life? Oh man. Yeah. A bunch. Um, Robert Cialdini's book, uh, the power of persuasion comes to mind really quick. Um, it really just talks about influence and the six categories in which you're able to influence uh, another human being, which is not to be confused with manipulation, right? Yeah. Two different things, two very, very different things. If you look at what, you know, leadership is, for example, it really is a, a form of influence, right? right? So there's a, a ton of positives that that's kind of extracted from that. Um, Jocko's book is, uh, is another one in terms of leadership as well mm -hmm. that I, I've gained, um, I've gained a bunch from. And then um, let's see, what's one that's kind of, that's kind of obscure, I'd say, because I, you know, I read mostly psychology, kind of personal development, physical fitness type stuff. But I will say this kind of out of left field is uh, is Chuck Palahniuk's books. <laughs> I usually stick to nonfiction, but every now and then I'll throw in a fiction to kind of change up the pace. Yeah. If you're not familiar with Chuck Palahniuk, he wrote I, Fight I, Club. And, and, um, and I read uh, his other one, Choke, which was really good. Did you read that one? I loved that. I've one. read Choke. Yeah, I've got, <laughs> I've got just about his, his entire collection right here. I think My I've read another one to too. Yeah, he's he's so funny. You know, like like sometimes like I, I read a lot of books like you're talking about, like like psychology books and, and you know, Jocko books and I'll, and I'll read your book and every, you know, books like that. And then every now and then you need to just take a break from that kind of stuff and read something funny. And you're still, you're still having this habit of reading and you're still kind of engaging and you're using the same part of your brain, but like you're laughing, right? Like, like, uh, Carl Hyacin's another one that I think you'd probably like. He's, he's, yeah. he's just hilarious, man. I mean, you're like, I, until uh, before I had read one of his books, I had never actually laughed out loud by myself just sitting there reading a book and just laugh hysterically <laughs> like you're watching a movie i had never had that experience before carl hyacin introduced me to that now you know i've seek i've seeked out other authors like that that give me the same kind of experience but polonic is is definitely one of them yeah, that guy's awesome awesome okay so um two more what is a 
an advancement in technology, some sort of technology that is advanced that has changed what you do or your sport or your activity? Advancement in technology that's changed what I do. Or enhanced your life or changed, changed what you do in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I'll start off kind of kind of like layup easy. And I talked about logs and I still have to this day, you know, paper mm -hmm. logs, like physical paper that you would write in. And I was kind of, I had this old school mentality for a really long time where that was the way you tracked and trained and, and documented. And you would think after me, you know, sweating all over these things and <laughs> ripping the pages in half and I'm, I'm all whacked out on pre-workout. So I'm right now <laughs> scribbled. You think I would have moved past that uh, a little sooner, given that all of us nowadays walk around with a computer right next to us or in our pocket. Yeah. Um, eventually I did come around and I transferred, or at least I began using, um, you know, different applications on my personal device to do the same thing. And it just wildly increased efficiency in production, which is what technology tends to do. Um, and then, you know, social media, powerful tool, man. Um, you know, I don't want to go too far down the, down the, the tangent, but what I, what I love about it is the, the community in which we surround ourselves with has an enormous impact on our success or not. Mm -hmm. right? Who do we associate with? And, you know, for me, the ideal community, this is also in the book, is, is, is three-pronged, right? It's comprised of mentors, allies, and protégés, right? Mentors being those we look up to, those we learn from, those we respect. Allies being kind of our teammates alongside us that we grind with, and they're better than us, and they push us and support us. And then you got your protégés, which you really earn once you've reached a certain point within your craft. And now you're teaching, which makes you better at yes. what you do. Mm -hmm. So kind of that tripod of what I consider to be ideal community. And, you know, prior to the internet and social media in particular, our community was geographically based, right? Like who I could actually talk to and spend time with was largely based on who was physically near me um, to at least, that, you know, broker that introduction to that individual and then yeah. talk through phone or handwritten letters or whatever. Today, thanks to social media mostly, you're no longer constrained geographically, right? Like I have mentors that I've never met before in my life that live on the other side of the planet, but I can still consume what they're putting out and I can still learn from them and look up to them and I can get better and I can critique myself based off them, et cetera. I can build a community. I can build my ally pool around me. Uh, you can do things virtually together, right? In a lot of ways. So I think that uh, it, social media has changed the landscape for just about every industry and most people out there. But looking at it through kind of the positive lens, that's what I like most about it is you're able to reach a much wider audience to surround yourself with those key personnel that are going to help drive you in the right direction. That's cool. That's probably the most positive spin I've ever heard on social media, but it's a hundred percent true. Like that. I love that. All right. Last question. We'll, we'll end on this. If you could leave behind one message, to this world, what would it be? I answered this question recently. I don't want to, I don't want to regurgitate the same one, but it's authentic. Um, and it is, this is not a dress rehearsal. And what I mean by that is, you know, you got one shot at this, at this life. And statistically, every single one of us alive on earth right now is a miracle by definition, right? Miracle being meaning an act so unlikely it is essentially impossible without the intervention of a higher power, right? Yeah. Statistically, the likelihood of us existing is like one in 600 trillion. There's just some crazy statistical odd. So life is a gift, man. And I don't want to get two kittens and rainbows in the clouds, but it really is. And you've got one shot to make the most of it. And I think we all have a responsibility to ourselves as individuals to make it a life of happiness and success. And when you've been as close to death as I have, 
and as many other people have, it really does provide you with a gift. And that is the gift, the gift of perspective. And you realize just how fragile life is and how fast it can be taken away from you. And once you've gone through that and you somehow make it out on the backside, still alive, still breathing, man, you just got to look at every moment as a gift. Forget about every day. I'm talking about moment to moment, right? And, you know, time is our most limited resource. It's our most precious resource. You can always make more money. You can always buy another house, right? You can always, you can always fix a relationship. The second that just went by is gone forever, right? So life is an address rehearsal, man. Um, take advantage of it. Uh, make it one of, of happiness and success, which I think are interwoven really with, within each other. And, uh, you know, with yeah, for a limited amount of time, why not go at it hard? Why not? Why not leave it all on the field? Why not? Like, what's to lose? You're going to die, right? We're all going to die eventually. Why not just leave it all, all out on the field, man? God, I love it. I love it, man. Nick, thank you. Thank you for this. It was a great podcast. This was fantastic. I wish you all the success oh, awesome. in the world, man, with this new book. Tell everybody where they can find the book, what it's called, how when it's supposed to come out. Yep, a book right here, boom. Um, the title is Objective Secure. It'll be available on Amazon and as well as my website. Standard copies will be available through Amazon. And those that want uh, signed copies can get them through my website, which is machinenick.com. And let's see, as we sit it today, was it the 14th? I think, again, buy something crazy. This thing will be available as early as the 21st is, is kind of our target window. So coming out here soon. And, uh, yeah, I just, I look forward to being a small pot in, uh, you know, in people's journey towards, towards success, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Nick, my man, one of these days we're going to share a workout together. Can't wait. Yeah, we are. All right, I appreciate man. it, brother. Good to catch up. Hey, you too, man. Thank you. All right. That's it for today. We'll talk to you next week. See ya.